Congratulations on making it this far. We are now in week seven out of eight of our class. So you got one more week to go. And this week we are going to study drama. And so this week uh, we'll spend one week studying the play Trifles by Susan Claspell. And so drama is one of the oldest form of literature. So drama has, has been around since biblical times where um, the, the church used to perform morality plays um, and in um, Chinese, in ancient times, um, theater existed in China also to teach about religious rituals, to teach about morality, and to teach about tradition, cultural traditions. And um, I will read you a few few uh, elements of what Aristotle considered to be the six elements necessary for having a good dramatic play. So according to Aristotle, you need to have, in order to have a good play, you need to have good plot, characterization, theme, diction, melody, spectacle. And so in, um, in both drama and literature, plot Character, characterization and theme are very similar in nature. So to review, plot tells, tells the events of the story. So when you have the plot, you're talking about the events of what's going on in the story in a book and the, the events of what's going on in a play. Characterization, just like in a book, you're going to have different characters. Uh, you have a round character, which is a well-developed character. You're going to have a flat character, which is like a one-dimensional character. You have a stock character. That's a character that never changes. And you have the dynamic character that evolves throughout the, the, the course of the story or the play. And so um, then you have diction. Diction talks about how the character talks. And how the character talks or speaks reveals a lot about who that character is. So if you have a character who speaks with a lot of bad grammar, you can tell that that character is not educated. If you have a character that speaks with a lot of uh, fancy words, you know that that character is educated. And then, of course, there's the snotty accent. You can also use different accents to indicate where the character comes from or whether the character is condescending or not. That in addition to body, body language. So diction talks about how the character speaks and which reveals to the um, reader or to the, to the, to the viewer uh, how, uh, what kind of character it is. So that's similar to in fiction when the fictional writer would write out the regional accent of the character in order to authenticate the dialogue of the character. And so as I mentioned earlier, Flannery O'Connor was very uh, famous for writing the Midwestern, the authentic Midwestern accent in her, um, in her, in her prose. So we're going to study, let me move closer to the camera so I don't keep disappearing. And so plot, character, and theme mean the same thing in drama as they do in fiction. But the difference in uh, plot, characterization, and theme in drama and, in drama and prose is in how they are presented. Because when we read a book, uh, the book tells us the story or the events. So you're, when you read a book, you're being told the story. But when you watch a play, the events are unfolding in front of you in real time. And so that's what makes drama or theater so much more exciting because it, the audience gets to interact with the actors and the actresses. And you get to see the actual uh, props similar to a movie. Although in a movie, the um, audience does not get to interact live with the actors and the actresses. So theater and opera have a lot in common because you have a stage, you have actors and actresses, and you have that interaction between the performer and the audience. So that's what makes, that's what gives theater 
it, part of what gives theater its drama. And just like any other piece of literature, you always, in order to have a good story, you have to have conflict. Conflict between a protagonist and an antagonist. And the protagonist would be the hero, and the antagonist is usually the hero's foil. In other words, the, the person against whom the, um, well, the antagonist could also be yourself. You could be person against person, okay? T different kinds of conflict uh, could be, you, you're conflicted within yourself, so you, you can be your own antagonist. And that happens if you're um, having mental problems, like in the, um, and then you have a person against pers another person, and that would be protagonist versus antagonist. Person versus nature, old man in the sea, in other words, and so when, when we want to show um, n person versus nature on stage, then you have th the setting, and the setting is usually alluded to because you can't have the full setting on the stage. But then it depends on just how extravagant the production is. Some productions, they can have really cool, these days, they can have cool 3D uh, visual effects behind the stage in order to have a more a th three-dimensional, you can have a picture of a mountain or video of a mountain or ocean behind the stage and then the stage could be like the extension of the beach or extension of the mountain. So these days with all the visual, you know, vi wizardry, you can add a lot more of the outside. So it was man against nature, they can still do it on stage these days. So um, what was I going to say? Oh, so plot, characterization, and theme, and diction are similar between theater and drama. It is just the way they are presented that's different. And so like I said, in a book, a book is written to be read, while um, just like a poem is uh, written to be sung, and a theater manuscript or screenplay is written to be performed. I'm going to be saying that a lot because it's going to become like the heart of this lecture. And then the other elements to, to have a good play is uh, besides plot, characterization, theme, and diction is melody and spectacle. And so these are, remember that these are the six elements that Aristotle considers essential to having a good drama. Melody, meaning that you add music to the performance. And so since Greek ancient times, um, musical instruments and singers have also been on stage in, in conjunction with the actual story and play. And so in Greek society, um, plays became popular when they had Greek tragedies. And so um, they would add, and so Greeks would have, um, they would add something called a lyre, L-Y-R-E, where the performers would be singing. It could be a, they could be singing love ballads. They could be t talking on stage, doing a monologue. And in the meantime, you would have someone in the background playing a lyre, um, which kind of looks like a guitar. It's kind of hard to. Uh, I'll show you a picture. Um, and in many in, in many cultures, um, they use um, performers would combine music, mime, melody, singing, and, and poetry together with their theater performance, all in one performance. And so I will talk a lot more about how that's done in other cultures. And so it's a very, very ancient to have music attached to poetry reading, even in biblical times. Um, and so here you have plot, characterization, theme, diction, melody. Okay, so, so I already talked about music. And in last week we talked about the um, connection between poetry and music and how that poetry was written to be sung. And that's why poetry has so many nuances of music, such as rhythm, and such as cadence, and such as rhyme, just like in the song lyric. Spectacle. Spectacle, I would say, is unique to theater. Because when we talk about spectacle, we're talking about the uh, props on stage, the lighting on stage, the performers, anything that has to do with stage performances in which you're standing on stage and then you've got the decor and the set, you've got the performers reading their and saying their lines, 
and you've got the beautiful costumes that the, they wear, that the performers wear, that's accurate to the time period. So if you're like um, in, in ancient Japan, you're going to be wearing a kimono and you're going to be wearing a mask because in, in uh, Asian uh, theater, um, the performer would wear a mask to embody the whatever their role is. So if you're playing the role of a god or a goddess, um, like the goddess of the river, for instance, you would wear a mask, and that mask is what that goddess or god looked like, and then you would play that role, and then your whole personality that is in Asian theater, when you perform, your personality disappears, and you embody that performance. You embody that character. Whereas in Western theater, you, 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 you bring your personality to your role, to interpret that role to your personality. So that's one of the differences between Eastern and Western um, theater, well, it's one of many differences. But the thing that they have in common is that in both Western and Eastern theater, we combine poetry, music, mime, rhyme, um, prose, and performance all together to combine to become a theater. And so all of the um, different kinds of genres of literature that we've studied, such as prose, poetry, and plays, can, are all interwoven together. This is why uh, a, lot, a lot of books can be made into movies, and plays can be made into movies, or movies can be made into plays, or vice versa, into books. And I find that for me, literature is just a way for humankind to express who they are in culture by culture. I'll get into that in a second. And so, um, so goodness. Oh, so when we when we tell a story and we want to see the story in real time, then that is what we see in the theater. One other element that Aristotle did not mention in his six elements of what it takes to have a good play is he doesn't take into consideration the setting. And so that is another important element of a good play. The setting of the play, uh, just like the setting in a book, uh, tells the reader where the story took place and when it took place. And so the setting would include uh, period accurate costumes. So that means that if, if I'm going to do a play about the 1960s, the, 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 the protagonist would all be wearing um, very, very short skirts, and or, and, or in, if it's in the 70s, 1970s, then you, they would be wearing bell bottoms. If it's in the uh, 19th century, for instance, 19th century Europe, then the females would be wearing those long gowns and, and very, very narrow corsets. And the, the, the men would have long um, braided um, powdered wigs. Okay, and so that sort of thing, depending on, on, the, on, the, on the culture. So, the, so costumes, so just like with spectacle, okay, the setting and spectacle, this, this, the, the, how the um, characters are dressed indicates one of the indications of the setting. And so um, for me, or for most modern theater goers, um, you have the seven elements of a good play. You have plot, characterization, theme, diction, melody, spectacle, and setting. So you need all of those elements in order to have a good, uh, a good play or a good drama. And so when Aristotle speaks of diction, he means the different ways each character speaks. Does one character sound less educated? This, I kind of mentioned this already. Does one character sound more snobby? Is he a foreigner? Does he have a foreign accent? Does he stutter, making him shy and timid or all the time? Or does he just talk about himself all the time, telling the reader that he is very selfish? And so in many of the books, um, authors do the same thing. In, in other words, they would reveal the character's traits and personalities through dialogue. And that is another major difference between prose and theater. In um, prose, which is written books, um, the author reveals the characters 
through the written word and through descriptive passages, whereas in theater, the story advances through dialogue. So therefore, while a book writer would use descriptive passages to tell a story, a, um, somebody who writes for the theater would use dialogue to advance the story. Because when you're at the, the when you're watching a theater performance, most of the most of the time people are talking, and it's through the dialogue that the story advances. And this is why most screenplays, or mo like Shakespeare, when you read a Shakespeare play, it it was Shakespeare wrote his play to be performed. So that way, when you read a play, you have to take into account not just the dialogue, but also the stage directions, because written into the screenplay would also be stage directions. So you would, for in instance, it would say, okay, character enters from the left, character enters from the right, character leaves the stage, now two characters start talking. So it's kind of like when you have a director of the movie telling the actors what to do next. And so what part of reading a screenplay and part of reading a play, when you start reading trifles, is to also pay attention to the stage directions. Pay attention to when a character enters the scene, leaves the scene, or when two characters are together, because that way it will help you visualize what is going on in the play. Um, and, and that's why I always advise students to watch the, the movie version of the play then read the original version of the play. Because when you write your literature essays, you're going to be basing your, uh, when you write your quotations, you're going to base your answers on the original version of the play. One of your assignments is going to be you're going to compare and contrast the film version of Trifles with the, the written version, the play version of Trifles. I think that's in week eight. You will be writing a comparison contrast essay. And I will go over how to write a comparison contrast essay in week eight. But right now, I want you to just focus on, you know, so, so knowing the difference between when you are reading a screenplay, so pay attention to the stage directions um, and pay attention to the dialogue. This will help you visualize the play as you read the play, the original screenplay. Um, and let's see here. Oh, spectacle refers to what we actually see on stage. So when we go to the theater, the stage, the set, the costumes, the actors, the lights, the props uh, are all part of the spectacle. In French, um, we would say spectacle. Je vais aller au spectacle. Means that I'm going to go see a theater performance. So the word for theater performance in French is literally spectacle. Okay, so, so that is how the French view the theater, is that it is quite the spectacle. They, the, the French focus on the actual. So when I was in France, I used to watch um, theater like Molière, uh, à la, and, and I would watch Molière, M-O-L-I-E-R-E. -E. Molière was a very famous French playwright. And he would write comical plays based on, you would have a, um, a, a young woman, and then her father is forcing her to marry some rich stranger she doesn't want to marry. And so in a Moliere play, um, the, the um, young woman finds a way out of that marriage. And then she would fall in love and, and marry instead somebody she loves. And of course, the antics of the, the, the lengths to which this young woman would go to avoid an arranged marriage to someone she doesn't love, makes up the meat of a Moliere play, and it's just very comical. You, and I think the most famous one is the Mariage de Figaro, that, would, that translates to the marriage of Figaro. And so, um, it, and usually Moliere plays are fun to watch because they usually have a happy ending. And in French, we would say, uh, le dénouement à la Moliere means that um, it's a Moliere happy ending. As soon as you say the word Moliere in French and you say denouement, uh, everybody knows it's kind of like saying the, a Disney happy ending. You, you know, it's a Moliere is like a brand name that means happy ending in French. Anyway, so I used to love watching uh, Moliere, uh, um, Moliere theater plays. Uh, Corneille used to write also theater, but his dramas were more. Um, 
cr critiquing of society and not, not necessarily they would have um, happy endings. He wrote earlier, in an earlier time, than Molière. But um, Corneille liked to critique society, and his most famous um, play was Tartuffe, in which he um, cr critiques, he critiques uh, the hypocrisy of some religious leaders who pretend to be religious and pious, but all they really care about is, is gathering money for themselves and gathering money from the rich um, in order to uh, you know, enrich themselves or something like that. And so it's that sort of thing. So um, I used to love to go to see the French plays. Another French play I saw was La Peste, which talks about what it was like to live during the, lock during, during the lockdowns, uh, the quarantines during the um, Black Plague. And so now that we're just coming out of the pandemic, so a lot of people are starting to read the ancient Black Plague um, novels. So if you're interested in that, you can read the Cameron. That's also about the Black Plague. It's not a play, okay? The Cameron is actually a novel in which a bunch of young people uh, es go to escape the city because the cities were filled with, with disease. And so they go off into the countryside into a, 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 a estate, somebody's country estate, and then they tell stories to each other, okay? In those days, since there's no television, no, no radio, and, that, and, the, and internet, so the only way for people to entertain themselves was to sit around in a group and tell stories to each other. So that's the, that's the more traditional way. That's why throughout time, stories have knitted or what bonded uh, cultures together because people would share their stories and then from those stories, each culture would form their own set of traditions and values around those stories. Um, anyway, so getting back to theater, and so theater has uh, exists, and theater exists in many different cultures. So, so far I've covered Western theater, you know, Europe and the United States. Oh, and in the United States, I went to, let's see, when I was in New York, I went to, I saw the plays on Broadway, I saw um, Cats, and I saw um, Avita, and I saw, uh, oh, Annie Hall, yeah. And I think I saw the Rockettes at the Radio City Music Hall. And so all of this theater, and I think I saw something in London, but that was, I think that was a Vita. Yeah, that was Vita. I think I saw a Vita twice, once in New York and once in London. And so anyway, uh, so, so, so far I've talked about Western theater. I'm going to touch briefly on Asian theater and how Asian theater, just like Western theater, uses music, mime, poetry, dance, singing, all in one uh, genre, all in one theater performance. And so in Asian, um, and just like in Western theater, Asian theater would focus, would have stories about love, ballads, uh, epic, such as heroic battles, um, what else? Uh, so so this, it's interesting how across cultures, the stories, the, the, the themes, of, of stor story themes seem to be universal. Love, hate, betrayal, um, you know, that th those, those common emotions translate themselves into dramatic stories that's to be performed to music, poetry, and song, and dance. And also in Asian theater, um, Asian theater, they use Asian theater to perform religious rituals and also to teach religious values to the audience. And Christianity did that too through morality plays in the medieval, European medieval, because most people could not read and write. And so for people to learn Bible stories, then the Bible stories in Western culture would be performed um, in a, like a theater. It could even be just street theater where performers would just perform a short Bible story and then um, people would give them money. So throughout, through many cultures, um, religion has been taught through theater. And so that in order to spread the faith, in order to convert more people to that faith, in order to reinforce that faith. And so if you go through Hinduism, Buddhism, um, and, in, and so I wanted to, and if you go to the week seven forum, there I posted a picture of my aunt my Aunt Catherine performed in the Chinese opera 
in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And there she is in her costume. And so in Chinese theater, they would wear a mask. Uh, and they would, they would put uh, a white, white mask, or sometimes they would have white uh, makeup on their face in order to be that, you know, the, in order to transform that person into that character, you erase your face and you put on another face, kind of like a mask. And so she, my aunt, would sing Chinese opera and then my uncle would play a spike fiddle known as the southern fiddle and he would play this flat fiddle known as erhu and also a bigger fiddle known as jinghu and in, if you want to spell it it's e-r-h-u and then jinghu is g-i-n-h-u not many, not many people know, even in China, not many people know how to play the erhu and the jinhu really well. And my uncle tells the story of how he was in the United States and they would, and in the United States they were making a movie and they, ne they needed somebody who could play the erhu for one of the scenes and he was the only one who knew, he was the only one in the Chinese community in New York at that time who knew how to play the erhu. And so that's why uh, my uncle's, I don't have a picture of that one though, but my uncle's ability to play, so that, so that means that while my aunt would sing in the Chinese opera, my uncle would play his erhu. And so that's how the two go together, is that um, one person would play the fiddle while another person would sing. And then she would sing about stories of love, stories of war, stories of just that, that, that. In that way, it coincides with Western theater, in which you, you have stories, theater stories, about love or about war, or having love but with a war backdrop. All right, so that, that, that sort of thing is universal. And so um, you can go to the Week 7 forum and you can take a look at my aunt as she's performing. And so I hope I didn't miss out. I took notes. Uh, this, oh, here it is. I took notes today when I was with my family, and so I didn't even know. You no, know, when I was growing up, I I used to watch my aunt perform, and she and we our family would gather together on holidays, and then I would see her rehearse um, her because she would perform in a theater, and then she would rehearse at home with her theater friends, and I would watch her, you know. Well, rehearse and then she would be singing I can't even um, you're gonna have to go to YouTube to listen to Chinese opera because it sounds totally different than Western opera it uses totally different um, melody uh, melody notes than I can't even, it's like it's as if everybody goes off key I know that sounds bad but it's just a different way of singing and it takes a lot of skill and she and my aunt would were very good at it and my uncle would play along on his erhu uh, as they were singing. So that's why I wanted to add that, you know, music, poetry, dance, um, and, and oh yeah, and then while they were singing, then they would also be dancing and doing a kind of Tai Chi. Okay, I'm not even going to try to talk about the dance because I just remember watching it and thinking, wow, how beautiful that was. And it never occurred to me to ask you know, what the dances meant, what they were singing about, or what the name of the instrument that my uncle was playing. I remember just watching and being enthralled by, the, by it all, going, wow, the spectacle of it all, you know, like, like, like the French. You know, you're, just, you, you're the audience and you're just enthralled by the whole spectacle without really understanding all of the technicalities. Just like if you were to go to the theater today, you may not understand how the lighting works, or how, you, how they set up the prop, or all the special effects that's in the background. You don't really think about that, because when you go to the theater, you just focus on the story. You focus on the spectacle of, of, singing, of seeing the, the performers perform there. Anyway, that's what I did, just, just enthralled by the spectacle. And I think that's the magic of theater, is that we're all enthralled by the spectacle of, of it all, the wonder of it put together. And um, just like when we read a book, we don't think about all of the sweat and tears the author put into writing the book. Instead, we're enthralled by the story. We're carried, and that's the magic of literature, is we get carried away into another world by the literature. 
So uh, let's see. I, oh, okay. I wrote here that um, the diff that ch in Chinese theater they would have love stories. Uh, that's like ballads, heroic stories like epics, and um, then family disputes, similar to uh, um, just like just like when you have Chinese opera on on television, and just like when you have television, we have family disputes. Then you have, and, and, and one of my uncles characterized Chinese opera as a Chinese version of Shakespeare, where you have historical disputes and court and king and queen disputes, just like in a Shakespeare play. And so what I find fascinating in, in my research as, I'm putting to get, as I was putting together this lecture is how universal these themes seem to be across cultures. Uh, a Chinese version of, of Shakespeare you know, I'm like, okay, so Shakespeare, um, you know, it's, it's, it's because when we study uh, literature, we're studying about humanity. So it shouldn't be surprising that across cultures you would find universal themes of love, heroics, um, court disputes, and king and queen, power disputes, the different power, powerful people, power grabbing each other. Um, disputing, and that, that, of course, that results in war, and then historical disputes, once, once again, the power grabs, and then all of the hypocrisy, the murder, and, and people trying to poison your food so they can become king, and that sort of thing. So uh, I, I learned a lot doing this particular lecture, and as a kid, I had no idea my uncle was playing at Ur, who, who knew? Okay, so I, I, I am glad that I got to, um, you know, do this, do this lecture. And here, and of course, in Japan, um, I think it's called the Kabuki Theater and the Theater of No, which is similar to Chinese theater. And um, so, I hope that you, um, you know, enjoyed my short foray into Chinese theater. That is by no means an exhaustive um, lecture on Chinese theater. I, I, I get the feeling I didn't even scratch the surface because I'm so Americanized and I know so little about my own Chinese culture. Um, and so this week, um, so if you have any more questions, usually whenever I have questions, I remember I was on the Zoom today with my family, and they, were t they knew more about, about the Chinese theater. And my father, he speaks Ch English as a second language. For him, Chinese is his first language. So he was the one who said, um, oh, it's called Erhu. Everybody knew about the Erhu, but nobody knew what you know, because my uncle played two instruments. One was the erhu, and then he played a bigger instrument known as jinhu. And we were all like, what was the second instrument called? Because all of us were so Americanized that so we know our English, but our Chinese is just not there within the second generation. So it was my father who had to say, your uncle used to play jinhu. You know, he, he was like, he's like the oldest one on the call. So you get to see the generational uh, shift. So um, anyway, so it was fun. So Chinese theater is fun, just like um, um, all theater is fun. And then what's fun about the theater is that it's, it's in real time. The action happens in real time. And so it's pretty easy to adapt uh, a play into a movie. But there are differences between a play and a movie and the written play and a movie. And so that's why when uh, you do your week eight assignment on comparing trifles, uh, the film version and the play version, you still need to read the original version, the play version, uh, in order to know the difference between the movie version and the written version. Don't just simply re watch the movie and then do your assignments. That's not good enough. You have to be able to read the original screenplay and watch the movie and then compare the difference between the two. And for me, obviously, um, when it comes to plays, I prefer watching the play. When it comes to the difference between a movie and a book, then I prefer the book because the book gives more detail uh, than, than the movie. But, I mean, that's a different discussion. So you, you don't have to worry about that for your week eight uh, uh, assignment. Um, so, so goodness. Oh, yeah. So this week, we're going to study Trifles by Susan Glaspell. So when we look at a piece of literature, we should not only look at the characters, but we should also look at the historical context of when this took place. And so, um, of when this took place and where this took place. 
And so um, Susan Glass Spouse Trifles takes place in the, around the mid, mid 20th century, I would say about 1940, 1950, 1960, 1970, thereabouts. And it takes place in rural America during a time when people lived far apart. And in this particular story, not many people have televisions or telephones in their houses. And at this time period, all, and, and no radios, yeah, no radios. In other words, rich people had telephones and radios, but, but the regular Joe did not, could not afford uh, to have a car, a radio, or uh, a telephone. That was all for rich people. And so this is before the advent of the television. So I'm, so, so I'm, I'm now reversing what I just said. Susan Glassbell's story takes place before 1950. Yeah. So you have here, um, so that way, if, if, you, if you live, if you have, so the main characters, Mr. and Mrs. John Wright, they live in a farmhouse. And they have no children. And so Mr. and Mrs. Wright live alone. And so for many, many years, Mrs. Wright um, lives with her husband, who's very, very controlling. And she has no other people to talk to because she has no telephone, no internet, no television, no radio, no nothing. Okay, it's just her bird. She has her bird and then she has her husband. That's her only outlet to the outside world. And then each neighbor, because it's in rural America, each neighbor, like miles and miles apart, you have to drive your car to get from one house to another. You can't just, unless you're in very good shape, you can walk over. And so the, the setting, see right now I'm giving you the exposition and I'm giving you historical context and I'm giving you the setting of the story, and that's why it's always good to know the setting of the story, is you have a very lonely wife, Mrs. Wright, living with a very domineering, mean, demeaning husband, nasty man, for decades at a time. And you have to know also that the character, uh, and, and also Glass Bell uses a lot of symbolism in this play, which I find fascinating. And so for instance, in, in the play, you have a, a an empty bird cage, and then the bird is found strangled. What does that mean within the play? And how does that relate to Mrs. Wright's loneliness? And that's a very intriguing question. To, as you read the play, you will find out how, how lonely she was and how desperate she became for, for company. And um, we don't find out and, and, miss, and, and, and the rest of the world, they don't find out about the, oh, okay, let me, let me, do, let me back up on the, on the setting. Okay, so you're in an abandoned farmhouse, and Mrs. Wright is looking out the window, and she's knitting, and she looks blank. And, 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 and Mr. Hale, he's a neighbor, he comes over to visit, and he says to Mrs. Wright, and he notices how strange she's looking out the window blank, not really looking at him, and he politely asks Mrs. Wright, I, I'd like to see John, uh, John, uh, John Wright, that is her husband. And then Mrs. Wright says something like, oh, uh, you won't be able to see him. John is dead because he was strangled to death. And she keeps right on sewing or knitting as she says that. And that's the opening scene. And, and then of course, can you imagine Mr. Hale's, uh, you know, surprise, shock, and all of that as he goes and finds the dead body and it hanging from, you know, you know, that sort of thing. So that's the, that's the opening scene. And then the next day, Mr. Hale brings the police, brings uh, other people, and so basically to, to investigate how did John Wright die? Who killed Mr. Wright? And of course, the main suspect is the wife. But you have to prove, you have to find credible evidence to back up your theory that Mrs. Wright killed her husband. And so that's what the play is about did asks the question, who killed John Wright? Was it Mrs. Wright or was it somebody else? How did he die? How did he end up strangled? And, and you know, how did he end up strangled to death? So that's the opening of the story. And then you have the men conducting their own investigation and then the women conducting their own investigation into how John Wright dies. I won't tell you any more because I would give away the play. And also what I want you to do as you read the plays, pay attention to why did J Susan Glassville 
named the play trifles. So when you look up the word trifles, trifles means something unimportant, something trivial. It's kind of like when you look down on something as non-important. Or you look at some person and you say, oh my goodness, she's, she always thinks about things that are trifles. She's so unimportant. She's so not smart. What an idiot. Okay, we, we really shouldn't listen to that person because she's such a trifle. Okay, so we want to put into context the word trifle means something not important. So why did she name, why did um, Susan Glassville name the entire play Trifles? And what has that got to do with when John Hale says something like, women, they only think about trifles. They're so trifling. I'm paraphrasing. What has that got to do? Why is that one sentence, like the thesis statement, or the main idea of the entire play? And in order to answer that question, you have to read the play, watch the movie, and come to your own conclusion and your own interpretations. Do you think that Minnie Wright killed her husband? And if so, was she justified in killing her husband? Should Minnie Wright be put to death? if she is the real murderer, what should be done? What, what would make, give justice to his death? Those are the questions that Glasspel uh, brings, brings forth. And not only the, the, the uh, legal questions, the ethical questions of what to do to bring justice to John Wright's death. And it also begs the question, did he deserve to die that way? And so that all, in a nutshell, uh, and so, so a good piece of literature lends itself to many interpretations and many layers of meaning and many layers of interpretation. So that each, per, each of us, what makes literature fascinating is that each of us brings to the, the table a different interpretation of, that, um, of, of these questions. And so um, you're going to be reading this play, and I'm sure you're going to find it fascinating. And what makes, and as I said, what makes theater fascinating is when all of the action takes place in real time. And so, how does uh, Susan Glassville use plot, theme, characterization, uh, spectacle, in order to write an excellent play that we will be studying? this um, this week. So let's see if I and this for, for week seven you're going to write a reader response journal where you're going to choose one female character from trifles and then you're going to give two examples of her strengths and two examples of her weaknesses. And so the three female characters in um, this play Mrs. Hale, the neighbor's wife, Mrs. Peters, the sheriff's wife, and Mrs. Wright, the victim's wife. So choose one of those female characters and write about, give two examples of her weaknesses and two examples of her strengths. And then you have to uh, go through the, the words, um, use figures of speech, use plot, characterization, um, theme, setting, and spectacle in order to uh, analyze uh, whether or not, to analyze the weaknesses and strengths of these characters. So all of that is in your reader's response. And so um, what does Mr. Hale mean when he says, women are used to worrying over trifles? Why is that the main idea of that sentence? How does that disclose the demeaning and condescending attitude that men held over women at that time period? And how does that condescending attitude um, affect the murder investigation? So that would be tone and tone and setting uh, and voice okay, and diction all wrapped up together. And so who murdered John Wright? And what does the empty birdcage mean? And so which, character, which female character is a flat character? Which female character is a round character? In other words, well-developed. And which female character is a uh, evolving and dynamic character? So you're going to be doing a character analysis this week of one female character using the literary terms that we've 
the, the literary devices that we've learned in this class. So um, enjoy this week's uh, play and enjoy this week's analysis and I hope that you enjoyed my lecture on theater. <laughs>